Hi, this is Grant Lobdell, the president of Dine Fire Protection Labs, the new home of the Drop Master. Today I'm going to go over what to do if your technician cuts the drum in half. I'm just kidding. We're going to go over three common questions we get. We're going to get uh, the question a lot of times about, well, I flip it on, nothing happens. What do I do? All right, we're going to talk about that. I turn it on and I'm getting poor suction. What do I do there? And I turn it on and I've got water shooting out of my muffler. All right. So let's talk about it first. I turn, I flip the switch and nothing happens. Okay. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. What am I plugging my cord into? Am I plugging it into a dedicated 20 amp outlet? Do I have anything else running on that outlet? Um, has the outlet tripped, the breaker tripped? Right? These are things to consider. When I'm running the unit, when I'm running the vacuum, um, the motor, I'm using about seven amps. When the motor's running and I'm discharging, I'm using about 13. So pay attention to where you're plugging it into and what else could be running on that. Are you plugging it directly from the cord we provide, the 20, 20 foot cord directly into the wall? If you use an extension cord, is that cord the same thickness or thicker than this 12 gauge? All right, if you're using too thin of a cord, that could be an issue. Has the GFCI um, that we've attached in the cord, has that tripped? Do you need to reset that if yours has that? All right, these are things to all consider when you flip the switch, nothing happens. And then on the unit itself, on the motor, has it been thermally uh, tripped? All right, so there's this thermal uh, reset right here, this button, if it has overheated, let it cool. Push this button in, you're gonna feel it, you're gonna hear it, you're gonna hear that click. You gotta push it hard and that'll reset the thermal overload. But consider, well, why did it uh, uh, overheat? Did I use too, too small of an extension cord for an example? Um, that would be if you flip the switch and nothing happens. But let's talk about you flip the switch and something tries to happen, it just can't. So you can hear the motor hum, you can hear it try to turn a little bit, but the, the, the shaft here will not spin. What's going on in that case? Well, for one, if you leave that, you are gonna trip it, it's gonna overheat. If it's trying to turn and can't, it will overheat, so you're gonna have to let it cool and trip that back. But your real issue here is why can't this spin? Yes, there could be bearing issues in either the motor or on the vacuum head, those are rare. We're not gonna talk about this today. We're gonna talk about the number one cause, the vacuum head seizing. So this is the inside of the vacuum head. I pulled the face plate off, if I spin it, those veins inside there dropping, that's how the vacuum head works. It grabs onto the air, shoves it out. It has to push the vein back in, so then it can come back, grab more air, shove it out. If this cannot spin, we could have had water in here that has corroded it and seized it up. These veins could be seized up in there as well. What we need to do again is pull that face plate off, pull these veins out, get them cleaned up, get them re-lubricated with oil, put them back in. This is a good time to bring up the oil on top of this reservoir. The oil level, the oil level should be half on this sight glass, half full. Any more than that, it's just more than you need, but it should be half full. At the end of the day, if it starts getting low, top it off. That should be part of your routine maintenance at the end of the day. It does continually use a little bit of oil. This other tube here, the vacuum it creates, it sucks in a little bit of oil. That's what's gonna keep those veins lubricated, keep them moving in and out like they should, and keep everything smooth. So no oil, you're gonna have problems, all right? So that's to go over. If we have, we turn it on and nothing happens. So we talked about, okay, do we have something electrical or is it trying and it just can't because this is seized? Now let's talk about poor suction. You've gone to the system, it's turned on but you're not getting your 10 inches of vacuum that you want, or you're at the, you pull the sprinkler and a little bit of water came out, or again, um, you can, it, you're used to it. It doesn't feel like the same suction um, that you're used to. For starters, what I'll always tell someone when I get this call, we're gonna pull and make sure we have closed the ball valve on the unit. Now that's gonna isolate our unit from the system. So when I close this, if my vacuum goes back up to 10 like it should, then the issue is not with the DM12. There's a leak somewhere in your system. Okay, but when I have this closed, if I'm still getting the same vac poor vacuum that I'm expecting, now we've isolated, yep, it must be something in the DM12, all right? So I'm gonna turn this back there. Let's start out with the gauge itself. Do I trust this gauge? There's some uncertainty in the gauge, you know, plus or minus one or two units, so anywhere from eight to 12 when we say 10, can be pretty normal. Let's say you're at five. Yes, that is pretty low. Make sure your gauge is in good condition. Make sure the needle's not bent or broken, all very common sense. Uh, make sure there's a rubber grommet on the top with a hole. Make sure that hole is not plugged. That's to make sure it equilibrates with the pressure around it, with atmospheric pressure. 
if you trust your gauge and it is reading low, now we're, what we're looking for is, okay, am, do I have a leak or do I have poor performance of the vacuum head? If I have a leak, let's just start from the beginning. Where could I be leaking? Coming in here, give this a little bit of a shake. Is that loose? Or could one of these welds in here be broken and we'd be leaking there? Are these bolts secure? Are they tight? Is the top of this secured on there? Is that tight? Okay. Now, when I'm talking about my barrel connecting to my vacuum head, we use a three inch hose right here. Is that in place or has it shifted too far up or too far down? We have seen it where when these units are dropped significant distance, maybe off a truck and that impact and that bounce, sometimes these can bounce up or down. Okay, so make sure that's connected. Make sure again, you can check everything, make sure it's not loose. We have no um, loss of suction there. The gauge, don't ever tighten it by hand by the top, use a wrench. Make sure that's tight on there. If everything looks tight and I don't seem to have a leak in the system, now let's actually look at the vacuum head. Number one, do I have oil in it, right? I need to have oil to make everything lubricated and work like it should. If you do, let's look inside the vacuum head. What can happen here? Well, what can happen again is if you have water get in here, which we'll go over to in the last segment of this video, but if I've had water go through here, these veins can actually get stuck up in there, either the water and oil, which don't mix, but it's kind of stripped off that oil and it's not lubricated like it should, or maybe the water is absorbed into the vein, swelled up into that position, and it's just stuck there. You can imagine if none of these veins were there or it was just stuck up in there, nothing's gonna happen. It's not dropping down to grab the air and push it out. You'd have no vacuum in that case, all right? So if you have poor suction, those can be issues there. Let's talk about one more thing while we have it spun to this side. Let's talk about this, this uh, check valve. So this is on my discharge side. Again, you could check here, make sure there's no broken welds, make sure these are tight. What a leak you could have, very common one, is if the discharge, uh, excuse me, the check valve has not properly sealed, okay? And you can check this by just putting your hand over the end of the discharge line, either the end of the hose or the end right here. When you put your hand over it, if you feel suction, your hand's being sucked into it, that's not good. Right, this check valve is supposed to seal. When it's not discharging, there should be no suction here. If you have suction here, you're losing some of your suction power from the, the suction side. That could explain if, you're, if your, valve or your gauge is reading low, okay? So why isn't my, my check valve sealing properly? Number one, it could be the debris in the system. Always make sure you have the Y strainer. I'm gonna turn it just for a little bit for that. The Y strainer here, make sure the basket that's inside of here is still intact, that should catch most of your debris, but and make sure you keep that clean every day. But you can get a little bit through there, it's not perfect, right? The pump should be able to handle it. Debris will be wear and tear on your pump, but it can handle up to half inch solids. And if that gets through, if that debris from your system gets through, and right when the discharge shuts off, if it gets caught in between the clapper uh, on that swing check valve and the ground face joint, it's not gonna seal properly. Right, and then you're gonna lose a little bit of suction out of there. In most cases, the next time it discharges, then when it fills back up a little bit, it's gonna clear itself out. But in some cases, the discharge might be, or excuse me, the debris may be stuck, and you may need to take this apart and clean it up. In the very worst case, the valve has been used so many times, think of the number of times it opens and closes, and it's worn down to where it needs to be replaced. With everything on this unit, it was designed in mind where hopefully you could go to a local hardware store if you were in a pickle, and get yourself something to replace it. If you're gonna replace it yourself, make sure you get the one inch swing check valve. Don't do the spring loaded ones, that'll impede the discharge flow. So I'm gonna go over one more thing on poor suction. Let's go back to the beginning when I said to close this valve. If the issue's not with the DM12, it'll go up to 10, and then you open this up, maybe some of you lose your suction, you may um, have a leak in your system. The other thing that can happen is you may have a gauge that reads 10 with it open or closed, but you have poor suction at the sprinkler. And that can be a blockage somewhere in the line, your most common culprit being this Y strainer. Maybe it's clogged, right? So if I clog it right there, sure, the vacuum's gonna read 10. I have vacuum through here, but I don't have any vacuum after the Y strainer. So that's something to keep in mind, even if your vacuum gauge reads 10, but at the sprinkler, you're getting some, some water, um, you, you, again, you're used to it. It doesn't feel like the same suction. Check your Y strainer. And getting as far as poor suction being at the, at the sprinkler itself, you're getting some water out. Remember, the longer the drop, you might have to go a bit slower. You might have to rock it a bit more before pulling it 
Don't just pull it right off. You do kind of have to rock it. It's the airflow going by that's going to bring that water with it. It can do 10 foot drops all day long, 20 foot drops. I mean, you got to go really slow. That is a lot of water. So just be careful. The longer drops you have, uh, there are limitations to any device. Now let's talk about the third thing in this video, water shooting out of the muffler. If you have water shooting out of these holes in the muffler, what's going on and how do I address it? Well, let's actually turn it a little bit to our, our dissected unit here. You can see from the vacuum head, the air, and it'll have a little bit of oil in it, should come down here, collect, and the only air should be coming out here. But if I have water coming in here, it'll fill it up and eventually come out those holes. Why do I have water coming through here? Should only be air and oil if we're operating this thing like we want. Let's go to the front. Let's remember how this unit is pulling in a vacuum. So it's coming from the manifold, coming down and pulling it in from here, and then from my system. So I have this headspace of air. The water level rising should only get so high, and the pump should kick on and should be able to keep up and discharge it. It should be discharging more than the incoming. What happens if we're not, though? Well, if I'm discharging less than the incoming, it will overtake it and it will rise to eventually, I have water right here. Now it's able to suck water up through my system. There is an anti-flood device right here, which should capture most of it. As the water level gets too high, it'll shut off some of the suction, but not completely. We don't want to completely do it in case you're in the middle of pulling a sprinkler in a place where you can't get any sort of water out. So not completely, but you'll still get a little bit of water through it, and that's what people are hearing. So that's just the symptom, the water going through the muffler. If that occurs, we're going to drain the muffler out, get all that liquid out of there. We're going to let the unit run with just air for a half hour to 45 minutes. That's going to help dry out the vacuum head to address any of those other issues we talked about today, the seizing, the veins sticking up in there, swelling. And then we're going to address the cause. So the cause here again is I'm sucking in more water than I can discharge. All right, so let's talk about how am I getting more water in or am I getting not as much water out? Let's first talk about the first part. How am I getting more water in than the unit was designed? So this unit is designed for intermittent residual water, the water from drops. It's not made to empty your mains. You should drain the system fully as much as you can before connecting and, and starting the vacuum. If you have a, a full main and you send that all at once, that can be overwhelming for the instrument and you may need to limit that. How do I limit that? Well, number one, again, try to drain it out as much as you can. Open up the auxiliary valve. Maybe pull the far sprinkler and let it run for five minutes before pulling any more. Let all that air and let it capture it. You can restrict the incoming water flow by maybe opening this just halfway. If you're gonna do that on the first sprinkler, just make sure before you go about your day pulling the rest of them, open that all the way. You want the maximum amount of airflow on that suction side. But that can be a way if you think you're overwhelming it, you're sending full mains that you just couldn't drain by gravity. The first sprinkler you pull, let it sit for five minutes, have it just halfway open. That'll keep the amount of water going in at once down. Okay? Other than that, there isn't really a way to suck more water without fiddling with the relief gauge, which never should do. We want that set at 10 just for safety reasons, so we're gonna leave that there. But there are many ways you can affect the discharge of water. You can impede it, okay? Let's talk about the, the hose, the discharge side here. How can I limit that? Well, we provide you with one inch non-collapsible hose. If I were to use a collapsible hose in here, I couldn't find the one inch non-collapsible we can provide. Okay, but now it's going to have to push open that hose, right? It's collapsible. Pump's going to have to work harder. It's not going to discharge as much. What if, again, I got a garden hose and I'm going to put an adapter on here and I'm going to put my three quarter garden hose on it. Again, now you've restricted how much it can pump out. Now it may be able to suck more in than it can discharge out. We're only, again, we're always talking about the level of water here. We want it to get it to so high, the pump kicks on, keeps it low. Uh, that could be an instance there. The pump may not work at all. There can be issues where the pump um, is nothing's coming out. All right, in that situation, you're probably gonna have to open this up and take a look at the pump. Inside the pump, there is a float that should be attached to it. If that float has come off, the pump will not kick on. How does that float come off? It could be if you transported this unit with water in it and the water sloshing down the road may be enough force. It's rare, but it may be enough force to knock that float off which is one of the reasons we recommend always draining the unit when you're done with it before you put it away or before you drive down the road with it. All right, or the pump itself, maybe again, if you've been sucking a lot of debris, 
uh, the pump has worn down, if it's gone through years, it may need to be replaced. Okay, so any of those situations, there could be more. That's just a few of the common ones. If I'm getting water out of my muffler, my water level has gotten too high, my pump's not able to keep up with the incoming. To address the symptom, again, drain the water from the muffler. Let it always let it run for a half hour, 45 minutes after something like that occurs to let it dry out. That's just going to save yourself from having another problem inside the vacuum head. So let it dry out, then address your cause. Is it something with the hose I've done to restrict it? Um, am I sending too much water at first? Did I drain my system as much as I could? So those are some common troubleshooting steps you can take in the field to address issues. Of course, there can be other issues. You may be looking for parts, and we're here to help. If you have any questions or you're looking to purchase some parts, contact us at 800-632-2304 or sales at DyneUSA.com.